We're going to be talking about the quantum harmonic oscillator, and we're going to discuss some of the properties of that, those solutions. Um, we know that the wave function, we discussed before that the wave function is of this form, where we have three components. One of them is the normalization constant, the other one is a series of functions, special functions that we call Hartmut polynomials, and the third one is a Gaussian function. Now, something interesting that is different from the other systems that we have studied before, like particle in a box, is that the normalization constant, it is not a single value for every single level. Now, that value it is still a constant, but it depends. It's going to change depending on the principal quantum number, epsilon here, the vibrational quantum number for my problem. Hermit polynomials, a special type of um, functions, polynomials, that also the shape is going to change depending on the principal quantum number. So now you can see that this expression looks a little bit uh, too complicated, so we can make some rearrangements, and particularly a change of variables, just to try to make our problem more tractable, easier to follow. So uh, if you use the frequency, and the definition of the frequency, you can make substitutions to come and start making it look a little bit uh, friendlier. Um, so this will be the shape if your wave function is expressed in terms of the frequency rather than just the force constant, for example. Even better, if you, for example, put all these constants together into this alpha term, then you can define a new reduced variable in terms of x, uh, this in this form. Okay, so with that substitution, we get a much cleaner form of your wave function for the harmonic oscillator. So now this one is in terms of this uh, variable chi, which is again a reduced variable, that it's connected to the axis of vibration and all the constant that define your harmonic oscillator. But this form is going to help us to treat the problem in a simpler way because instead of having to write down all these constants, everything is going to be embedded into chi. Later on, when we solve the problem in terms of this reduced coordinate, we can always trace it back to the actual axis where the bond vibrates. But we can do that all the way until the end. It's going to be much easier than if you have to carry in all of our calculations all these variables. Okay, so three components, a constant, Hermit polynomial, polynomial functions, and then a Gaussian type. If we plot these three functions, you're going to see something interesting. This being a constant, it's always going to be a fixed value, and it's going to be a horizontal line. The Gaussian has this bell curve type of shape, and the Hermit polynomial, it's a polynomial of degree that is related to this principal quantum number. So one of the things that you can observe is that neither the normalization constant nor the Gaussian function is going to give you nodes for your wave function. So the nodes that you're going to find for the wave function of this harmonic oscillator, quantum harmonic oscillator, are going to be given by the polynomial, in this case the Hermit polynomial. If you have a Hermit polynomial of order 2, meaning that this is the second excited state for this problem, you're going to have two solutions, two points where the, uh, the polynomial crosses your axis, and those are going to be your nodes. So something to, to have in mind, because now what you can do is, once you plot the probability density for the different states, every single one of those nodes that you're going to find are associated with the Hermit polynomial of that particular vibrational quantum number. One thing that you can observe also in terms of all of these uh, distributions from principal quantum number zero, the ground state, all the way to the 18th excited state, is that this probability density is always um, have this symmetry around the equilibrium position for the vibration of your bond. That symmetric distribution is very important. It's going to become very handy to know that whenever we are calculating certain properties of that particular system, like <clears throat> the average position, for example, the average kinetic energy, and so on. Another thing that you can notice is that as the principal quantum number increases, there is less probability density around the equilibrium position and more probability density around the extremes of that distribution. These uh, extreme points is what we call uh, the turning points of your vibration, and uh, the fact that this uh, probability is increasing on those extremes is telling us that as the, quantum, the principal quantum number increases, your problem becomes more and more like the classical harmonic oscillator. Okay. So we find, found out by this analysis that the Hermit polynomials are actually a very important part of that wave function. Here I have a list of the first six, seven uh, Hermit polynomials. Remember, each of them are associated with the principal quantum number in our case, but in general it associated with an index. And depending on that index, you're going to have a polynomial of this degree. For degree zero, polynomial of zero, degree zero. Uh, for quantum number one, first uh, degree, second, second degree third excited state, third degree, and so on. Okay, so uh, these Hermit polynomials are solutions to for the following uh, differential equation. They also have this uh, precaution relation, which basically tells you that you can relate um, the Hermit polynomials with their neighbors. And something that's going to be very important for us is this orthonormality condition for the Hermit polynomials that is going to basically going to help you to calculate the, uh, they're going to help you calculate the normalization constant for your wave function. So let's actually explore that a little bit. Uh, before we go into that, you know that the way that you can plot Hermit polynomials in Mathematica is relatively simple because it has a built-in function already. This is the um, uh, the syntax for, for that, Hermit h. This is the degree 
of your polynomial, and this is the variable that it's associated with that polynomial. So, for example, if you were to plot the fourth order and your variable is y, you are going to print the, uh, you're going to plot that Hermit polynomial. So, uh, when you plot it, and you can do it in different fashions here, I'm just showing you the first uh, six polynomials uh, for that. Those are the plots uh, from these uh, series that you have in here. And so the plot for each of those polynomial functions are going to be shown in this grid uh, from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And here you can actually corroborate this idea that uh, the solutions for those polynomials equal to 0 is exactly where you find the nodes that will correspond later on to the nodes of your weight function. So for, let's say, uh, the Hermit polynomial of uh, degree 4, you have to have four solutions, and that's going to be those points where this uh, function is crossing your x-axis, or your axis. So that's going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, and you can corroborate the number of nodes is equal to the index of your Hermit polynomial, the degree of that polynomial. Okay, so another important property, as I mentioned, was the integral that defines these orthonormality. So let's do one example. If you have the general expression, but now you say that actually these two indices are equal to one another and, and both of them equal to two, then you're effectively doing the calculation for the Hermit polynomial of degree two, which is going to be this one here. Um, then do the integration. You come to this one, since this is exactly the same index, then uh, that means that you can use this property this is the same index, so this delta Kronecker is going to be equal to 1, and then you're going to end up with the square root of pi times 2 to the uh, power of the index, which is 2, times the index factorial, which is 2 factorial. When you do this calculation, you're going to end up having 8 times the square root of pi. Before I, I keep going on, I just want to stress out this idea that uh, if you are following the textbook from Atkins, uh, they use this y variable, whereas here I'm showing you in terms of this reduced variable pi. These two are the same. I'm just going to tell you those are labels. There's no difference between the way that this notation is expressed and the notation that I'm using. The only reason that I don't want to use y is to avoid confusion in terms of this y being the y-axis, for example. Since this is the x-axis for the vibration of my bond, I don't want you to get confused that this refers to an axis. It is a variable that is related to your axis of vibration. It is a reduced variable, but it is not anything to do with the coordinate Cartesian system x, y, z. Okay, so in order to avoid that confusion, that's why I'm putting this variable chi. Okay, second example. Now the index is going to be the same for both of them, equals to 4. That goes to the fourth degree Hermit polynomial, which is here. So effectively, you will be calculating this integral. But I know, according to my uh, definition of orthonormality, that if these two are the same, I'm going to end up having this particular result, square root of pi, 2 to the power of the index, which is 4 my index, index factorial, which is 4 factorial, put all these together, and then those are going to be equal to 384. So you can clearly see that as the quantum, principal quantum number becomes larger and larger, this is becoming a little bit more complicated to do. So what we can do then is to use uh, Mathematica to actually help us solve this problem. And this is what I'm doing here. So I have these two Hermit polynomials, just the same definition that I have here, times my Gaussian function. I'm going to integrate over all space with respect to these uh, reduced variable chi. And I have two indices, these uh, m and n. Here I'm calling them epsilon and v. But the idea is that every single time that these two indices are the same, I'm going to end up having a solution that looks like this, because again, this delta Kronecker is equal to 1. But in the moment that these two are different, delta Kronecker is equal to 0, so everything goes to 0. So it's either 0 when they're different, or a value related to this expression when they're both equal. So this is what you have for index 9 and 9. You end up having this value for your uh, integral. But in the moment that this is different, everything is going to be 0. So unless these two values are the same, you get something. In the moment that these two indices are different, it doesn't matter if it's a big difference or a small difference, they're always equal to 0. Um, that's something that you can test. And also, if you are you know, practicing your um, skills in Mathematica, you can produce a table like the one that I'm showing you here, where now uh, you can look at the different indices for those two uh, two different indices here, and it's going to be generating a table where everything should be equal to zero except the diagonal of your grid. Every other value, when those two are equal to each other, that's when you get a numerical value that is diff different from zero, a non-zero integral value. Okay, uh, please let me know if you have any questions, and I'll talk to you later.